Welcome to Demand Does the Six Questions, where the same six questions can tell a unique story. I am your host, Daman, father of two, husband of one, and leader of this here Demodcast. Thank you. We have another great episode for you today. This is another episode with an author, and one of the things you'll love is she brings her unique perspective on storytelling. Last week, Valjean Jeffers took us on a journey through her creative process and foray into voodoo. Check it out if you haven't already. Also, thank you for the reviews. Somehow it affects the algorithms and it shows more people that were around. So if you haven't yet, please subscribe and review. It helps more people join the conversation. Today's guest writes and creates 3D illustrations, art, and character designs for mixed genre speculative fiction with elements of fantasy, paranormal, sci-fi, magical realism, urban fantasy, Afro-retroism, erotica, suspense, and Afrofuturism. Her work can be found in the Dark Universe Anthology, the Steampunk Anthology, Genesis, and an Anthology of Black Science Fiction, Book 2, and more. She's also one of the contributing authors in the upcoming vampire anthology, Slay, Stories of the Vampire Noir. Please help me welcome Penelope Flynn. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Yay. What is Afro-retroism? All right. Now, Everyone hears the term Afrofuturism, which is, you know, those people, members of the diaspora, looking into the future. You know, like Star Trek with Lieutenant Aurora, that is a future construct. But what Afro-retroism is, is looking back to the past, which means everything that's sword and soul is Afro-retroism, because we're looking back to an alternate history. Steampunk also, that is Afro-retroism. You have even um, some of the things that were some of the works by Octavia Butler that fall into the the category of Afro-retroism, like Kindred, because it goes back into the past and up to the present. It doesn't touch on the issues of future. So Afro-retroism was actually a term that I coined back a few years ago doing a panel discussion at Florida A&M University. Milton Davis was also there, and I think Valjean Jeffers was also there, and we kind of discuss this, the fact that we have two different things going on, seeing people as in members of the diaspora into the future, and then finding our place in the past. And it kind of came about as a result of when I had a, a really good friend when I was in college, and she read those gothic romances, you know, back in the past, and, you know, when the men and the women and the beautiful clothing and the hierarchies, etc. But in any case, when you saw these books, read these books, they usually had black people placed as, you know, the noble savage or, you know, servants or something of that ilk. So together we had made a decision that we were going to try to write about a woman who was an heiress back in Philadelphia, you know, at the turn of the century, whose father was, you know, in trying to transport because it's like this whole period of time that black people are erased from the speculative fiction world. And when we're in there, it's always either servants or some sort of a magical Negro, you know, it's like we would say individual, never people who are captains of their own destiny, who have a sense of agency. And so that's what we're starting to try to deal with and which Afro-retroism deals with. The fact that we are not just looking forward in Afrofuturism to claiming the future, that we are going to back up and we're going to claim the past. So that's what it is. That's really cool. Are you ready to answer the six questions? Yes, I am. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Question number one. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? All right. This is one of those interesting questions because when I was really young, I started writing. You know, I wrote poetry, little stories, things of that ilk. And I'm sure that you ran into this probably when you were growing up. If you are a person, uh, a black person, and you grow up and you're supposed to be a smart person, if you say, boy, you know, mom and dad, I want to go into the art, they are going to look at you like you grew antlers. 
you know, if you had the capability at all, you're supposed to go into the profession. And of course, you know, when we were growing up, we we're all kind of steered into the professions. And I'm an attorney, actually, by trade. Really? And only, yeah, so only as I've gotten, you know, to the point in my, my life, I realized that writing this thing, speculative fiction is so important to how it is that we see ourselves, the make-believe of it, you know, the ability to broaden how we feel and see um, each other. That happens in writing. It happens in literature. And, you know, although the, the legal profession is, of course, important, honorable, I think that we make more of an impact on other people of color, of members of the diaspora, and even those who are not members of the diaspora, when we start to write about who it is that we are, that we see ourselves, we tell our stories through our filter, not someone else's. I, as I you know, got older, um, I guess in my 30s, I guess when I started writing again, and you know, I took screenwriting, and I you know, started writing short stories and, and things of that ilk, but only really started going back to novelizations or you know, that part probably about, I don't think it had to be, but oh, oh, 10, what, 20 years ago, that I actually thought maybe I would write a novel. But then on top of that, I started doing the 3D illustrations, and I know part of it also is a desire to graphic novelization as well. But yeah, about, it was an on and off thing, but only after I had been in the legal practice for a very long time did I decide, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pursue this. So I would say, and when I say 20 years, that's not even really being fair because part of it is a hobbyist. And I only more recently, in the past 10, decided that, okay, I'm going to do this for real now. I'm going to actually write. So my alter ego still practices law, but I write. Gotcha. I was going through your website, and there is a section called Flow and Audio. And you have uh, the, you call it Flowscapes. And these, they're these. Yeah. Um, I guess to describe it to the listener, they're, uh, they, they look like uh, 3D landscapes. And yeah. I was um, actually, uh, the kids and I watched one of them and we were just completely enthralled. And I'm curious, how did you get started in doing these? Well, the flowscape concept, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, this moment, I cannot remember exactly when it was that I saw it. But it is an incredible little tool, a, a landscape tool. Your kids are very young. This program is like $15. And you load it, and you become, you know, a master of that landscape, creating anything that those little pieces that they have in there allow, you know, you, you put in the water, you put in the trees, the animals, everything, and you can create those landscapes. And you, it is very relaxing, very meditative. And I would say, especially now that we're home, a lot of COVID-19, not sending our children back to school, that that, if you have a mouse, trackball, whatever, and 15 bucks, was it uh, steam.store, get in there, get them some flowscape, and let them work with that in creating uh, their own landscape. I started prior to that with Dash 3D, which is a free program that allows you to create 3D models and scenes. Then I graduated to Poser, which was a you know paid program, and I didn't get Poser because Daz was bad. It's just that in the Daz program, the models they had of people of color were not to my liking. Poser had much more beautiful depictions of people of color, of black people. And now, of course, in the intervening period, that Daz has caught up but I'm still such a uh, proponent of Poser. I've been on it for so long. The other program that I've gotten into, which is the Real Illusion properties of iClone 7, they have a plugin that gets you to Unreal, the Unreal engine. So what? basically, you're, yeah. So you're at the point now where you are creating characters and that now you are in the world of animation, being able to animate using that Unreal engine. And as you know, if you've ever seen that PlayStation 5 um, upcoming trailer, that is slick, impeccable. It is just fantastic. Right now, if I had a little kid, like your kids are really young, 
And if they have any interest at all in this stuff, I would be weaning them on these three-dimensional systems and learning how to work with them. And I think this is not going to ever stop. I think that it's going to only get bigger and think in terms of a situation like with, as we are right now with COVID-19, that so much of Hollywood is at a standstill because, you know, these actors, these producers, directors, lighting people, everyone that has to be on set, that everyone then is at risk. So you can imagine something that you are creating that looks exactly like a person or pretty doggone close, that instead of having your actors there with each other, that you are able to do a depiction of them almost perfectly them in animated form. And these things are quite incredible. So I'm thinking right now, this is the thing that I would definitely have, you know, my young ones learning how to do because I don't think it's going to go away. But I think that that's the way of the future. And, you know, right now, I would say if your kids have any interest, give them Flowscape, let them play with it, see how it works, let them Blender, which used to not be as user friendly, but it is free. And Blender, I mean, actually was used on, you know, several. 3D film um, application and Dash 3D also is now being used on 3D film applications. But Real Illusion, iClone, the one that I used, that was used in that recent uh, film with Keanu Reeves where he was like a clone of himself or something like that, that they used the Real Illusion, iClone 7. So all of these things now are becoming more and more a part of what we see and they're becoming industry standard. Again, I'm off topic a little bit, but it is part of the concept of writing and storytelling. And so we need to be able to tell our stories in every way as possible, like the graphic novel, animation, audiobook, paper, back books, the Kindle ebooks. I mean, my next foray into my short stories over my ebooks is as you see, right, when you talked about the Flowscape, because in certain ebook platforms, you can install video. So you can imagine that you're reading a story and it's telling a tale, and you open up, you know, your splash page, and there you are. There's a ship on the ocean, and you see the water, and it's moving. And whatever that land is that you're supposed to be going to, you see it right in front of you, and it's just like that in Flowscape, it's moving you know, and it's real, it's right in front of you. So that concept of doing things like enhanced ebooks, that's a thing as well. So I think, you know, instead of us calling ourselves writers, we have to really, you know, rename ourselves as storytellers and then figure out every way possible that we can tell that story. And that's kind of where it is that I am in, you know, in my career, quote unquote, as a writer, that I want actually to be a storyteller and try for myself. I mean, I consider what I'm doing kind of like a lab and I'm working through these things so that I can tell other people, this is how you do it. This works. That doesn't work. We need to be broadening what it is that we can and cannot do. I am not a sculptor by any stretch of the imagination, not even digital, but there's a thing called ZBrush and I've wanted to try it for a long time, but not particular ability. And it's really expensive. But just recently, they came out with ZBrush Mini. So if you have someone who wants to try that ZBrush Mini to see whether they have that aptitude in doing the digital sculpting, I would say, get your kids in it. Let them try it. You know, it doesn't cost anything. Why not, right? Right. So I'm I'm really in enjoying the aspect of storytelling and that we should promote when our children, not just the profession, not just sports, but the concept of storytelling and telling the stories through the prism of our own experience, that is invaluable. When we see now, we have stories now being told, written by people of color, and it may be, you know, this is a Cinderella story, but it's not exactly a Cinderella story because it's told through our filter, the prism of our existence. So now it's become a new thing, you know, so I would again, encourage the storytelling aspect of what it is that we do because uh, that's, that's an important, it's important development for us culturally to be able to tell our story. Absolutely. Wow. Mind-blowing. 
Oh, my goodness. Or I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to let you go on to the next question. When people look back 100 years from now, and they are going to ask, what was the most important cultural event in the history of mankind? And they will say, it is rap music and hip hop. And you say, why do you say that? Before rap music and hip hop, in order to sing, in order to have your thoughts that were inside of you regarding love, hate, politics, whatever, you had to be able to sing. You know, There's so many people who could not sing, but had so much to give with regard to what was going on in your head. And then here comes this thing, rap music, where you don't have to be able to sing, but now your thoughts can be conveyed over music, even if you sound like a croaking frog and everybody's listening and they're dancing and it becomes part of their consciousness. So I think, you know, 100 years from now, when people look back and they think, wow, I mean, look, think about it. There is rap music in every continent all over the world. A thing made by, you know, kids, you know, in New York and in California. Right. Right. And now it is a world language. You know, if you listen to, you know, Korean K-pop, every K-pop group has new rappers. You know, in Japan, they got rappers. You know, if you watch the film back in the 80s, early 90s, Once Were Warriors in New Zealand, they're walking down the street, the guy's sitting there at the corner rap. You know, it has changed the world. And people have not noticed it yet because it's so, you know, it's done so quietly. But it changed what it was that we are able to hear because even Kurt Franklin said he can't sing. So when he made the song, you know, stop. It's basically rap, gospel rap. And that even changed how it was that, you know, people consumed or absorbed a gospel music. This thing to bring language and music together in a form that just really has become more literal, more literary. And like I said, 100 years, people look back and say, wow, that was the thing, the tipping point that brought all people in the world more together. Because everybody doesn't necessarily know, do classical music. Everybody doesn't necessarily do anybody else's cultural thing. There's no one that does not know rap music. Question number two. What do you wish you had known when you started out? As a writer, the thing I wish I had known when I started out was that I didn't have to be inspired. You know, I didn't have to have, a, you know, a great idea. I didn't have to have a big idea or a grand scheme that all I had to do was just sit down and write even if it was bad to get into the habit of just writing. It's different with legal stuff. The legal stuff, you know, you kind of sit over it, there's facts and there's law, you know, there are, you know, cases that you read to support your argument. But when you are trying to create a world, when you are trying to create people out of nothing more than the ether, that is really, really difficult. And sometimes you know, I just gotta get up, I gotta take a walk, or I can't, you know, it's not all coming together. Then it's like, my daughter is also a writer, and I tell her what I wish I had been able to tell myself, which is, it doesn't matter what you write, write something. It doesn't matter if it's in the story that you are currently writing, write something. Keep your butt in the chair for the allotted time and write something, because it is very easy to get distracted, to close out all those tabs, don't go checking your email. Any of that, you've got to put the butt in the chair, focus on that empty blank page. If you aren't writing new filler, edit if you have to, but put the time in to just be typing, writing, changing, get into that habit. That's the thing I think I would have told myself, to just stay in the seat, don't wait for inspiration, type just anything, just anything. You know, look across the room and you see a red and, and, and black tie. Write about the red and black tie and the conversation that it has with a pair of shoes. Anything. Just get in the habit. That's what I would have told myself. That is advice I sorely need. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. You're good, good. I'm glad 
that other people you know, will get the benefit. And it's a good question because when you're asking for these things, and you do get the benefit of other people's uh, mistakes and the things that we wish we had done differently. And I'm glad to hear that you know these things are going to help you as an artist, as an entertainer, you know, and um, that's wonderful. Just wanted to take a break in the action to tell you about Different Worlds, Same Story, a podcast starring myself and class historian Madeline Rosenberg, where we rewatch the classic TV show, A Different World. We talk about the themes, how the show is still relevant, and the Wayans family. It'll make more sense when you listen. I'm not saying just go listen to the show. Just remember, new episodes of Different Worlds, Same Story drop every Thursday at 8.30 where you download this podcast. See you then. And now, back to the show. Question number three. What's your go-to order at your favorite hometown restaurant? All right. There are two, and like two opposite ends of the spectrum. One, number one, is True Lux, which is, you know, a steak in you know, surf and turf type of, you know, upscale restaurant. And when we go there, there's an order we make, and that is of escargot. And their escargot is to die for. But it's not on the lunch menu. Sometimes not on the dinner menu. You just have to know that they have it. So we order it always off menu. So we go in and say, can we have an order of escargot? People look at us like, what the heck is that they just ordered? Nobody is that. They're looking on their menu. You just have to know to order it off menu. But that escargot at True Lux is the number one. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, my comfort food would be Chicken Express. I don't know if everybody has Chicken Express, but Chicken Express has the best chickens, fast food chicken. But the thing they have, other people don't have, that they do absolutely right 100% of the time is fried chicken livers. And then they have their rolls, which are these really delicious, fluffy, yeasty rolls. That I love. So you go there, you get your fluffy yeasty roll, your cream gravy. I go. Uh, where do you live? I live basically in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, so you know what cream gravy is, right? Yes, ma'am. Fried gravy. Okay. So you get your cream gravy, you slather it on your chicken liver, you put it between that big fluffy roll, cut it in half, roll, and have your chicken liver sandwich. Oh my God, that is like the best thing ever. So on one end of the spectrum, yeah, two luck. On the other end of the spectrum, the chicken liver sandwich, self-made chicken liver sandwich made with the roll, cream gravy, fried chicken livers. Oh my God, that is to die for. They don't taste the same, but certainly equal in my esteem as far as my palate is concerned. <laughs> Question number four. I can't wait to hear the answer to this. <laughs> what are you curious about? All right. I, mean, I thought about this. What am I curious about? And I said, think about it. I said, you know, there's not many things I'm way curious about. But then I said, no, that's not quite true. The thing I'm most curious about is other people's cultures. You know, we live in the United States and we are bombarded all the time with the concept of American exceptionalism as if what's going on outside of us doesn't matter, or in fact, you know, sometimes it's you not know, just the mode is lesser. I went to Europe when I was in college, and I went to Italy, and I went to Spain, and I went to Greece. I did not go into North Africa because we were told we should not do that, you know, because we were a bunch of young women traveling together, and this is probably the most safe thing to do at that time. But I would like to have done that. I would like to go to China. I've always had an interest in going to China. I know it's got issues, but I want to see it. You know, I want to, I would like to go to Shanghai. I would like to look at it. You know, I want, there's so many places in the world I want to look at. When we were children, I remember going to Jamaica, to Mexico when we were children. And there, my husband said he would like to go to Prague. Why not go to Prague? I like the concept of interacting with people, their languages, my top of my list, the number one place that I would like to visit, Brazil. I would love to go to Brazil. I know there are issues there, certainly issues regarding race and colorism, etc. 
but I would like to go to Brazil. I would like to talk and interact with women there to discuss these issues. How it is that we kind of unwind the brainwashing that goes on in countries like that where the, the uh, black population is very high, but um, poverty for black people is also very high. So how do we change those things? But I would love to do that. So my curiosity extends to culture and language and things of that ilk. I am a big K-drama fan. I like historical K-drama. But one of the things I realized when you watch these K-dramas is that, you know, as African-Americans, we are consistently looking back at the slave culture that existed here in the United States. But do you realize that they had slavery in Korea as well? And that I don't believe it ended until after slavery ended here. And that you have an entire society of other people who have dealt with, you know, slavery that was as vicious as the slavery was in the United States. And, you know, these things that we, people from these countries, should be talking about that and the legacy that those slave cultures had. Now, because um, in Korea, they tend to be more of a homogeneous society that once you, you know, strip away the trappings, of royalty and slavery, and everybody kind of looks pretty much the same, then maybe they can get away from it faster. But because slavery in the United States is predicated on color of skin, of texture of hair, you know, then those things that follow us generationally, you know, are, you know, and they maintain still these biases, these mythologies that are created in order to keep people enslaved, those things still exist because there was never a playbook afterwards, you know, telling people, okay, slavery is over. And so now this is what you must do. Not for us. Certainly. Nobody gave us a playbook saying now what you get to do. This is how you do it. This is how you escape from any type of servitude that ties you to this land. When they are trying to contort this and, and make this slavery now into now you are a person who no longer has a job working on somebody's plantation, so now you're loitering. And loitering is a crime that we can use to put you in prison and now make you a slave again. It's a different type of slavery. You know, we needed to be talking across cultures, learning, you know, how these things are happening to us, how, you know, religion has been used, you know, against us. And that happens and has happened and it's currently happening all over the world. So these things, these cultural, these, you know, these cultural cues that may help us unlock problems here and abroad for all people, you know, I would, that is a thing that really piques my curiosity. You know, I, I want to know, you know, how it is that um, other people have tried to unravel these things, maybe not completely, but if we look at the way that other people have unraveled these issues, maybe it will help us get on the road to unraveling legacy that we have of slavery, hardship, that has been pressed, and of course, not just black people, but poor people generally, that we have just been pressed into the category of poverty so much longer than everyone else. They've been able to climb out of it, but it's kind of like a caste system, you know, in the United States where we are like pressed into poverty. And there are, you know, other people, of course, who are poor, who are in poverty. But for us, it appears that it's almost like you're born into it and you have to work extra hard to get out. And then from generation to generation, they're still trying to pull you back into it. So every generation basically is almost like starting over, all over again. How has that informed your writing? It has informed my writing in the sense that one, that I am aware of what I don't know. So I do a lot of research when I'm dealing with cultures. And I do deal with cultures um, with regard to my magnum opus, I call it, which is Renfield. In the Slay Anthology, which is upcoming, is uh, my short story is called Unclaimed, and it is a Renfield story. If you have ever read Dracula or seen Dracula, you know that there is a character whose name is Renfield. Many years ago, I thought about the fact that Renfield is this madman, loses his stuff, he, you know, is a, an acolyte of Count Dracula. But I started thinking, okay, so what if he wasn't the only one. What if he was just the crazy one? What if Renfield 
was an entire family whose job to um, stock and trade is to maintain the life and lifestyle of these vampires. So, because I'm all into things that I'm into, science fiction, fantasy, horror, erotica, also the right erotica, that I put all these up in a big ball, and that's what Renfield, but it's more than just that, the story of these people who take care of the Revenant. It is the fact that these people are hybrids. They are part vampire, or we call them Revenant, and paradoxin, which is what human beings are called. They are called paradoxes because our revenants, our individuals in the Renfield universe, they are not from here. They are from a different dimension. They travel here from their very idyllic world where they are all, all academicians and they are trying to reach into this dimension in order to find new resources, the scientific discovery, and they come here. But what happens when they come here is that they change. The place they live is called the Land of Everlasting Twilight. It's called Abijah. Everyone there is approaches life in shades of gray, that there is no absolute sunlight, no absolute dark ever. It's kind of always some form of twilight. Everything is shades of gray. There is nothing that is um, diametrically opposed to any other thing. But when they come here, you've got the brightness of day, the darkness of night, You've got oceans, and then you've got desert lands. So you've got, for them, it's called you know a hydro desert, and then a sand desert. These extremes. There's poverty, and there's great wealth. All these extremes, and they are not built for it. So they bifurcate when they become here. They become on the one hand civil, and on the other hand feral. And that's how you get these vampires that we are so used to in you know, our vampire lore, that they are people who came here who cannot deal with how this place, which they call the paradox, because everything is one way or another. It's a complete paradox to them. In their life in the paradox, are these paradoxes who are regular human beings. And then we have these revenants who are those who have come over from Abisha, their home world. And between them, the revenants make a decision that regular people don't live very long. So they tried to make them to the servants and it didn't work. So then they said, okay, someone made a mistake, quote unquote, had a child with one of these regular people. And then that individual lived for a very long time. So after that person lived for a very long time, they're thinking, well, we should consider, consider doing this and breed them, which is what they did. So Renfields are bred to be servants of the Revenant. Now you have a regular human beings and who, you know, fast forward thousands and thousands of years who know that Renfields exist, know, you know, kind of what they do, so they don't trust them. But the one side of you that is, you know, paradoxical human beings who don't trust you. Then you have the other side, the Revenant, who you have to serve, but they see you always as Lesser, even though you share the same blood, that they consider their people, these Renfields, as lesser. Even though the Renfields are the quote unquote day walkers, they can do everything that the Revenants can do and everything that the paradox, paradoxes can do, but they are not accepted by either side. So they kind of circle the wagon and they are very insular in how it is that they deal with life. Now, this solves a few issues in my writing, which is how is it that black people specifically can have these sumptuous lives historically and not always be people's servants and things, although there are, you know, of course, situations where, you know, black people have been in, you know, positions of power and wealth, but generally, especially, you know, those of us in the United States, how do we write our fantasy? Well, we have this thing, Renfield, who exists, who coexists with history as it is moving along, but with their own hierarchy, their own empire. So that's basically what it is that we built this empire. And everyone in it, all different colors, backgrounds, all different countries, the world, different cultures, they're Renfields, and every 
habitable continent. But when you're reading what it is for everyone that is there, you have to figure each person, each individual, is the life of a black person because that's what it is. These are the stand-ins for the type of lives that we have, you know, being a hybrid. A lot of us don't even understand it because, you know, we say, oh, yes, you know, Africa and Africa. But we are African by blood. Some of us, you know, European, not just by culture, but also by blood. So we're here in this place, in this country, and we are a very unique people in that we really are truly a hybrid, but a hybrid that is generally misunderstood by both halves of its lineage. And so that's kind of what Renfield comes from. That's what my writing is when you read Renfield and you're going to, especially as you know, a member, and not you know, the diaspora generally, but African American specifically, to deal with the fact that there are members, you know, of our group here, our culture, that are, that are xenophobic. You know, we don't like anyone that's not us. You know, we have some that are very accepting, bringing in, you know, more people into our fold. We have all of the uh, hierarchical challenges that there are with people from the outside and from within as we compete with each other as, you know, as, as men and women. And then as we support each other as men and women, how we take care of our children, that it does in this, these works, it does take a village. And even the first book that was published last year in November, Garden Koyescu, when you read it, it's great fun. But when you're reading it, think of it in terms of someone who considers himself an ally and how it is that he relates to the entire Renfield issue because he's a revenant. And even though he supports the Renfield causes, thinks that, you know, he's down with everything, that, yeah, but when, you know, the rubber hits the road, how do you really feel? <laughs> so it's that. And so I work through Renfield's with my using horror and erotica and fantasy and paranormal and shapeshifters, etc., in order to discuss this, our culture, and how we find our place in the world. But it's, it's, it's a lot of fun read. But also it has some allegory there that as you're going through it, you know, you'll find it, you know, you'll accept it, trash, it doesn't matter. I just want people to read it and think. And, and really think about who it is that we are as a people, who it is that you are when you are reading these different characters, where do you find yourself? So it, it, it should be fun in that sense. And that's why culture, yes, I am concerned with culture because I am writing about diverse cultures, even though they all ultimately relate back to who it is that we are. Because so many of us have so many other cultures in our bloodline. Question number five. Is there anything I should have asked but didn't? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, <laughs> okay, what you could have asked me is like, Penelope Flynn, what do you do outside of your writing as a creative endeavor, endeavor or means of uh, relaxation? And I will say to you, when you ask me that, and I'll just let you ask that. Yeah. Miss Penelope Flynn, outside of your writing, what do you do for relaxation and all the other stuff that you said that I can't remember? I'm so glad you asked. I am a collector. I collect things, and I the collections I have change from like months, well, year to year or years to years. I have collections of dishes, Johnson brothers transfer wear. Then I have Johnson brothers or whatever type of uh, transfer wear or uh, porcelain, what do you call it, uh, call it soup bowls, double handled soup bowls. Then I have my silver. I started collecting silver uh, tea sets. And then um, I collected silver place settings, you know, the utensils, eating utensils. And then oh boy, I got to collect the silver ice cream fork. Yes, there's such a thing called an ice cream fork. I collected Madame Alexander's sissy dolls. So these big dolls, like 23 inches tall fashion dolls, and then the clothes that they wore. Then I got the entire collection 
of the Doug James and uh, Laura Meissner uh, Summers and Field Dolls and all the clothing. And I have those in the trunk. We collect comic books, my husband and I both. I used to tend toward DC, which is from my childhood that I was a DC person who's Marvel. And so we have the DC and Marvel comic book um, collections, little golden book collections. Yeah, we are big collectors. Marvel Legends, the, the action figures, huge collection of those. Yes, we collect things. And then, for fun, I like building dollhouses, the lighting in them and everything. I haven't done one in a while, but I am I have bought a kit and I want to start out and you know put this one together. So that thing also I do to clear my head for enjoyment. I like to see the final product, you know, when it's done. Uh, but those are the things that I do in order to clear my mind, relax, whatever you want to call it. So yes, that's that's my my go-to. Nerd time. Who's, <laughs> who's your favorite comic book character? Uh, okay. Now, when I was young, I was a big Superman fan. When I was young. All the Superman fans, I don't know if you, they make that anymore. Superman family comic books, they were like regular size, you know, like big, like a magazine size. Thick. You know, like a digest. They're huge. Superman family. And I used to buy those all the time. When I was in college, Storm, of course, I was a big X-Men fan. Storm of the X-Men has a special place, you know, in my heart. I would think that more recently, um, I do like Batman. When they came out with Batman, the animated series, my children were very young back then, like your children are very young now. We recorded it and had to wait until my husband got home from work, and then we would sit there and watch Batman, the animated series together at night over dinner. So yeah, we are real big comic book nerd people here in this house. But right now, I guess I say if I was going to pick, I am going to pick Niobe, which is Stranger Comics. Sebastian Jones created this character. It is an indie comic imprint. The story, uh, Asunda, was picked up. Asunda is that universe. It's been picked up by HBO. As soon as we get back into studios and start, you know, doing this work, this is going to come out of HBO. It is one of the uh, shows to watch. They think may be the next big thing after Game of Thrones. Okay. So let's say I'm going to go with Niobe, your comic, as my go-to girl, go-to young woman, a go-to deity right now for comic books. I have some research to do now. <laughs> Game of Thrones big? Yes. But look up Stranger Comics. Yeah, definitely get into it now. They have done so many uh, Kickstarters. It's art. I mean, the way it's written is just so artful. And that's why I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the word, the untamed. That's it. The untamed, a sinner's prayer. So when we're done with this, you jump on here, the untamed, the sinner's prayer. If you look, it'll come up. There's one that's 10 minutes. And 50 seconds, that's the one you want to read or you want to look at because it is, it's wonderful. Because we follow her from when she's very young to her adulthood as she is becoming who it is that she is ultimately going to become. When you look at the character Niobe, you're going to say, boy, she looks really familiar. She does look familiar the way she's originally drawn because she looks like Amanda Stenberg because Amanda Stenberg is one of the writers. Stranger Comics. Question number six. If you were to create a new holiday, what would it commemorate? All right, this is actually for me very easy, and for you, you will not understand it at all. It would commemorate becoming an empty nester. There, I mean, I have five children, and when your children uh, are growing up your entire life wrapped up in your children and rightly so. 
that's the way it's supposed to be. But then when you get to the point where your children are of age, they're getting ready to take all those wonderful lessons that you've taught them and go out into the world. And then it's kind of like, okay, here I go. Bye-bye. And then, you know, you're both kind of standing there like, what just happened? There needs to be a holiday to commemorate, to celebrate your kids being able to get on out there and you becoming an empty nester. And it's never truly empty nest because they, you know, always keep coming back, you know, for this, that, and the other thing. But the concept that now that you all have returned to being a couple again and that this is something to celebrate and nobody tells us how to um, become that again. So that's what I would do. I would have a holiday that commemorates the day when you you hug and kiss your children, you send them off into the world, and you look back over at your spouse or your you know your friends or whoever it is that's around you when that moment comes and say, okay, how do we live this new life? So that is the uh, the holiday that I would create. Empty nester day. I find another language to say it in so that would sound really cool but um yeah that's what it would be that sounds like a one of those rite of passage uh holidays like a 16th birthday an 18th birthday a 21st birthday your wedding uh your your anniversary right and then you have whatever we're gonna call because this is a we now because it's my show (laughs) um but whatever we're gonna call empty nester day what parting gifts would you like to leave with uh, with our listeners? Well, of course, it's a slay anthology that is out, and this is 29 different writers who are all writing stories of the vampire noir, which is going to be very interesting because there's a certain conception of what a vampire is and how it acts and what it does, and I think many of these writers have their own conception of how it is. I mean, as do I. Because, of course, my story is a Renfield story. It is called Unclean. On the heels of that, at the end of October, October 30th, is the release date of my Renfield, my my second Renfield novel, which is called The First Book of Ramona. And Ramona is the heir apparent to the Renfield empire, this divided, in a way, empire that on the one hand, this spiritual head, and their you know, traditional head. On the other hand, they have a corporate head because Renfield International is the largest uh, family-owned corporation in the world in our alternate universe, the paradox. Ramona is getting ready to be the first Renfield that ever runs the corporation and is the traditional head. And these are her trials for the first and second book of Ramona before she actually moves into the position occupied on the one hand by her mother as traditional head and by her mother's consort, who is head of the corporate entity. Those who are my patrons on Patreon will receive theirs a book earlier than that release date, and they'll get little special. And that's, you know, Patreon and Penelope underscore Flynn is my Patreon. You can find me on Facebook under Penelope Flynn Media. And just if you want to just talk to me without writing, you can get me on Facebook just as Penelope Flynn. Any questions, anything you want to uh, discuss, PenelopeFlynn.com, that's my website. And if you are, end up being particularly enamored of Renfield, Renfield.us is my site that only deals with Renfield. So that's it. And, and, and this has been just such a gas. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Thank you, dear listener, for spending a little of your day with us. And thank you for the reviews because they are a huge help. And if you haven't done that yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download this episode. Leave a review for us. It helps the show get seen by more eyes and we can have more people join the conversation. So until next time, see you. Hear it, speak it, 